to the book of Numbers, chapter 32. Uh, Numbers is the fourth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And I want to talk to you about uh, being an encourager and being encouraged. Numbers chapter 32. I've been in my morning devotions reading through the Bible, first a book of the Old Testament, then a book of the New Testament, and going back and forth. And uh, I was reading through the book of Numbers and came across this passage and I just felt uh, like I'd like to bring a message this morning from here. This is when Israel is about to enter the promised land for the second time. If you know the story, you know they had a first time, obviously. And when they didn't obey the Lord in that, God made them wait 40 years. And then the second time is, is what we're looking at here. So Numbers chapter 32. <clears throat> Let me read starting in verse 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the lands of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses, to Eliezer the priest, and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, now he gives a bunch of names here, if you, you forgive me if I mispronounce them, Adatoth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eliela and Shabam and Nebo and Beon, those are places. Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle. And thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over Jordan. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them. Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up unto the valley of Eskel and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. I'm just going to stop reading there. They've come to the point where God has brought them again to go into the promised land. <laughs> and... Uh, Two of the tribes, it's actually two and a half tribes, it ends up, say, you know, they get, they get to the Jordan, they're going to go over the Jordan and, and conquer the land like God has, has said, but they say, we like it here. <laughs> we have cattle, this is a good land for cattle, we'd like to stay here. Now, you've probably experienced, physically, there's people who never quite engage, you know, they never really get involved in what they, what they should. Now, maybe we get this turned off, uh, brother. Um, you know, there's, there's people who never really get involved in their family like they should. They never really get involved in their church like they should. Uh, they never really get involved in their country like they should. But sp spiritually, he's talking here about finding God's great blessing. You know, crossing the Jordan, you know, sometimes songs talk about it like it's death and, you know, different things. But crossing the Jordan represents entering the place of spiritual blessing. They've come to the Jordan and God has the promise waiting for them. And here's two of the tribes, two and a half tribes who say, well, that's all very well, but we kind of like it here. And I was telling my wife, I think when they said that to Moses, there was a very palpable silence. I think Moses got real quiet. And they thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and Moses, his first words are, shall your brethren go to war and shall ye sit here? Why would you discourage them? It was his question to them. And I felt like that's something that we need to consider. We need to be encouragers, not discouragers. Uh, Moses asked the question, and we need to ask ourselves this morning, why would we discourage others? And the, the specific lesson he gives us here is we discourage others by not doing our part. Now, now let me cut ahead here a little bit. Uh, those two tribes, uh, I think they see the seriousness of the situation, and they, they work out an agreement. They say, well, we'll leave our cattle and our, our women and children here, and, and we'll go armed with you, and, and, and we'll help you come. We'll, conquer the land with you. But 
you know, we discourage others when, when we don't do our part. You've seen it happen. You know, you're, you're involved in something and there's others who should be involved and, you know, they're not, they're not doing their part. Uh, you're pushing a car and somebody else is kind of, you know, casually not helping. You know, that's a physical thing. But with spiritual things, it's discouraging when, when you see others who, who should be a part of the work and they're not. Now, Moses relates it to the first time. They'd been here before. <laughs> They'd come to the, to the promised land. If you remember the story there in, in Numbers 13 and 14, we'll look at it a little bit more later, but uh, you, you know, they'd come up, they sent in 12 spies, and uh, Joshua and Caleb came back and said, we can do it, let's do it. But the other 10 said, oh, it's too hard, we're afraid. You know, there's always excuses why we don't really do what we should do, aren't there? Oh, it's too hard. <laughs> I'm afraid, I'm, af I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, God's truth, let me show you how, what God says about this in Hebrews chapter 3. He comments on this situation. Hebrews chapter 3, verse, I'm going to read several verses, but starting in verse 17. Hebrews 3, 17, he, he's talking about that very situation where the first time when they came up to the land and they wouldn't believe God and God had to have, make them wait 40 years while all those adults died. Verse 17, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You see, they'd come up to this point before, and because of unbelief, They'd missed God's blessing. That whole generation, God said, is going to die before I'll give you the second chance. Sometimes you don't know. You get an opportunity, you think, oh, I'll take the next one. You may not get another opportunity. You know, an opportunity to witness to someone, an opportunity to serve the Lord, an opportunity. You just don't know when that opportunity is going to come again. But you know, it, it discourages others when we don't do our part. Uh, the Bible says that these, these people were guilty of sin and unbelief and hard hearts. Uh, I've just been amazed lately to see how often we harden our hearts towards each other, toward God, uh, towards the things that we should be doing. In uh, Hebrews 3, verse 12, he says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It, it, it discourages others. Our unbelief discourages others. Uh, we're, we're not in this thing alone. Fear is catching Unbelief is catching. And the opposite is true as well. If you'll serve the Lord, you know, there's others who say, oh, well, guess, I guess I can do that too. Uh, it discourages others when we won't believe. Verse 13, he says, But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Our sin discourages others. You know, when people see us in sin, uh, it's, it's discouraging for them. Verse 15, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Uh, we discourage others by our hard hearts. Have you ever had somebody harden their heart toward you? Uh, you know when it happens. You know, they, they walk away, and it's like, man, I'll, I'll never, they may not even say it, but it, it's like, that's it. And people do that to God. People do that to biblical truth. People do that to people. I talk to people all the time, uh, you know, ask them about their son. Oh, I haven't talked to my son 14 years. Come on. You only get one go around in life. Quit hardening your heart towards people and, and towards God. We think uh, things like this, unbelief, hard hearts, we think, oh, that only affects me. No, it doesn't. We're, we're part of each other, especially as a church and as Christians. What we do affects others. And that's what Moses is, is saying to these, to these tribes. Uh, who are they? Gad and, and Reuben. God wants us to be encouragers. And I uh, said all that to get to the next point. If we're not encouragers, uh, go to, to verse 23 of, uh, well, let's go back to Numbers chapter 32 and, uh, and verse 23. This is a, a verse every Christian should know. <laughs> every parent should share this with their children. Let me give you the background. Verse 20, he says, Moses said unto them, if, if you will do this thing, if you will go armed before the Lord to war. You know, they'd said, okay, we'll, we'll leave our cattle, we'll leave our children, and we, we will go with you as soldiers. Uh, verse 22, 
uh, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord. But, verse 23, but if you will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. You need to know that verse. It's repeated again in, in the New Testament in, in a different way. Be sure your sin will find you out. Moses is warning them. He says there's going to be consequences to the decisions you make. Some of you are still young. When I was first in the ministry, I used to get people say, oh, you look too young to be a pastor. I haven't heard that for a while. <laughs> I'm going to start hearing the other end of it pretty soon. Uh, the decisions we make as young people, the decisions we make in our life, no matter when, they're going to have consequences. And, you know, people need you. People need you to be an, an encourager. I had one pastor say to me, Oh, I don't need fellowship, he said. I don't, I don't get with other pastors. He said, I, I don't need fellowship. And I said to him, well, brother, did you ever think that some of those other pastors might need fellowship? Oh, never thought of that. See, we're not just in it for ourselves. We're in it for the glory of God. And God gives us a warning. Moses gives these tribes a warning. Be sure your sin will find you out. We need to keep our word. Uh, we need to encourage others. And he's telling them, keep your word and encourage these other tribes. And, and if not, there's going to be a result. Now, I, I don't think they were making the right decision anyway to stay on that side of, of Jordan. And I, I believe that there were some consequences because when you see Jesus talking uh, in his life in Mark chapter 5, he comes uh, in Mark chapter 5 to uh, the country of the Gadarenes. Now, where's that? That's where the tribe of Gad went. And what's the first thing you see? A demon-possessed man comes out to meet him. And when he casts the demons out, he casts them into a, a herd of swine. What's a, a tribe of Israel doing herding swine? That, that's like a Christian being a bartender. I mean, it just, just doesn't go together. You see, there had been consequences. That they'd moved away from the, from the things of God over time. Now, maybe... You could say, well, all of Israel had, but uh, there, there are consequences to the decisions we make. Um, be sure your sin will find you out. And the application is for us today. Uh, will your decisions affect you? You better believe they will. You're going to make choices today that will affect you tomorrow and, and, and in, the, in the rest of your life. Uh, the, the verse I was referring to in the New Testament is Galatians 6, 7, when he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The seeds we plant today will harvest tomorrow. The decisions we make uh, have, a, have a great uh, determining factor in our lives. Uh, you, you know, as, as, a, as a man, if I don't put my, my family and my God first, man, it's going to affect me. Uh, if I don't... Um, do the things of the Lord, make them important. It's going to affect me later on in my life. Now, I think most of us don't want to be discouraged by others. You, know, you don't wake up in the morning and think, oh, boy, I hope somebody really, really socks it to me and discourages me today. <laughs> you know, that, that's not what we want. And I hope you don't want to be, be a discouragement to others. You know, I wouldn't think that would be our goal in life. Maybe some people, you kind of feel like it is. They want to drag everybody down, but... You know, as Christians, we need to be encouragers. And we need to start by living for the Lord ourselves. Uh, I hope you will determine to be an encourager. And, and I want to tell you this morning, the best way to be uh, an encourager to others is to know how to encourage yourself. That's where it needs to start. Now, uh, we're learning a little bit about babies. Uh, some of you, you know, we have some foster kids. They're not babies, but, you know, close enough. And uh, you've got to encourage them. Okay, yeah, yeah, come on, let's, let's do this, you know. But folks, I'm basically talking here to adults. We shouldn't have to do that to you. Oh, come on, you, you should obey. It'll be good for you. You'll like it. I'll give you a lolly, if you will. <laughs> now, you know, spiritually speaking, we shouldn't have to do that, should we? You should be able to encourage yourself. Now, there's going to be times when you'll face discouragement. And, and I'm not saying... Uh, that you can't get with other Christians and that we can't encourage each other. But it starts with knowing how to encourage yourself. 
Do you remember the story of David when they'd been out to battle and they came back and the enemy had taken all the women and children and burned their village? You talk about discouragement. Good grief. And his men began to cry. <laughs> it's okay to cry. Then they began to blame him. Let's get it. It's his fault. And the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. You see, he was a, a mature man of God. He was a man who loved the Lord. And because he encouraged himself in the Lord, it changed what those other men did. He led them to then go and rectify the problem. They got the women and children back. They, they solved the problem. Because one man was willing to be an encourager. And he started by encouraging himself. And, and I want to uh, say this very strongly this morning. This is something we, we must learn as Christians. You're not going to go through life without getting discouraged. And if you don't learn to discourage yourself, you'll follow the world's beliefs and let it turn to depression. And then you go around saying, oh, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. You'll take medication, you'll do all these things that has no help, and you'll miss the blessings of the Lord. You'll stay on the other side of Jordan, spiritually, and you'll miss the blessings of God. How to encourage yourself in the Lord? Well, uh, we could talk about this for weeks, but let me just give you a few things. One is be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Now, the key to that is in the Lord. But it takes you making a decision many, many times. You see it in Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were strong in the Lord. Let, let me read that that I mentioned earlier, Numbers 13, uh, verse 30. This was the first time when the 12 spies had gone in and, and Joshua and Caleb were, were all for it. Numbers 13, verse 30, uh, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Man, that's positive, isn't it? He was an encourager. And chapter 14, the end of verse 7, this is both Joshua and Caleb. They said, the land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Now, have you ever heard a saying, a modern expression, that's as easy as pie? What that means is it's easy as eating pie. That's what he's saying, and that's the Hebrew expression. They'll be bread for it. It's like eating bread. No worries. Maybe that's what the Aussies would say. Uh, he said, if we'll trust the Lord, the Lord can do this. Uh, we need to be like those men. We need to be encouragers. Uh, there's a, uh, the account of Abraham, and God mentions that in, in Romans chapter 4, when he says of Abraham, um, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, he, God, was able also to perform. God asked Abraham to do some amazing things, and Abraham did it because he believed God. Listen, most of the things you and I are going to do are pretty normal things. <laughs> you know, uh, we don't have to leave our, our home to go somewhere we don't know. We don't have to offer our child on an altar. You know, uh, there's not many unusual things you and I are going to be asked to do. But God asks us to just do the normal. I'm not sure who that is, but please take it out of the room. Be strong in the Lord. Uh, being strong involves trusting the Lord. Uh, like Abraham, like Joshua, like Caleb. Funny world we live in nowadays, isn't it? Uh, we run around having people talking to us all the time. Uh, trust the Lord. Have courage. You know, that, that's a common call that God gives to us. Have courage. Uh, th there's a passage at the end of 1 Corinthians where he says, let me get 1 Corinthians. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. He's just saying, uh, be strong. Like men means to, to have courage. We had a family joke in our family. We'd, we'd taken a trip and listened to uh, the magic pudding. We used to listen to stories as we drove. And one of the expressions was, well, I guess all that's left now is to give way to despair. <laughs> and we used to, every once in a while, we'd look at each other and say, well... I guess all that's left now is to give way to despair. <laughs> and we were just joking, you know, we, we didn't give way to despair. 
But isn't it strange how often we're so quick to do that? You know, things happen, we think, oh, well, guess I'll give up. <laughs> Listen, God calls on us to have courage. There's an example in Scripture, even of God's enemies doing that. You know, the, the Israelites are about to defeat him, and they say, well, guess all we can do is have courage. And they do. If they can just trust themselves, surely we can trust our God and be strong and, and have courage. And the, the New Testament equivalent might be put on the armor of God and pray. In Ephesians chapter 6, he, he talks about the armor of God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We do have an enemy. There is a battle. But we can be strong in the Lord. Now, later on in, in Ephesians 6, he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We're in it together. Uh, we can put on the armor of God. See, God not only has what we need to fight the battle, God has what we need to win the battle. And it's his battle to win. Now, all of these examples, you know, Joshua and Caleb, David, Abraham, they were men of faith because they believed God's word. Now, we have the complete word of God. They didn't. But when God spoke, now sometimes God would speak directly to them, they would believe him, and they would work. Uh, David, if you look in 1 Kings chapter 2, David gives a charge uh, to Solomon. 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 Kings 2 Verse 1 says, The days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. So he's saying, be strong and believe God's word. It sounds very similar to what God said to, to Joshua. You remember in, in Joshua when uh, he became the, the leader of Israel, the Bible says that God spoke to Joshua after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. It came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua. Let me read quite a bit here. It's Joshua 1 verse 6. God is, is telling him, be strong and have a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn, uh, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Wow. What a, what a word from God that we have here in the book of Joshua. And Joshua was a man who believed God's word. Now, to believe God's Word, you need to know God's Word. You need to at least read it. God tells you to study it. Memorize it. Uh, make it part of your, of your life. Uh, I tell you, the best way to learn the Bible is to teach someone else. The very best way is to teach someone else. Now, you say, well, I'm not a teacher. Well, there's got to be somebody who knows less than you do. Learn one thing, there, you'll be somebody you know more than. <laughs> Uh, teach somebody else, but at least start to learn. And then, secondly, commit yourself to live God's Word no matter what the cost. And that's the key. If you're not committed to obey God's Word no matter the cost, then you're not committed to obey God's Word. We don't take a vote and say, well, should we obey God or not? Uh, you get the only vote in your life. You decide. Commit yourself to live God's Word. <coughs> And do it in God's strength. You know, like we read in Ephesians, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It's not just you. It's the Lord. That's, that's what it means to be strong in the Lord. Now, we've talked about His Word, 
But you know, God also has given us his Holy Spirit. In, in Acts 1.8, he said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, in Corinthians, he, he says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Yeah, at one point he was saying the Holy Spirit's coming. Now he says, listen, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. And the problem we have is found in Thessalonians when he says, quench not the Spirit. <laughs> uh, if you're saved, it's not, do I need the Holy Spirit? You have the Holy Spirit. But are you going to listen to him? Are you going to let him help you? God's Word, God's Holy Spirit. Man, what powerful weapons we have in this battle of life. A Christian has the Holy Spirit. A Christian, as free people, we have access to God's Word. And it's there to help us, to encourage us. You know, you can sing it. <laughs> There's scriptures we know as songs. Uh, you, can, you can pray it. You can meditate on it. But first you have to get into it and value it. Yeah, our, our relationship to God should encourage us. That's where the Bible and the Holy Spirit come in. Let me say this. If you're a person who relies on God's word, that must involve being part of a local church. Listen, you cannot be right with God and not be a part of a local church. Now, I don't mean there's not times when you'll be passing from one to another or something like that. But your relationship to your church should encourage you. God's given it for a purpose. He's given it for you to have people to help you, and for those people to have you help them. Uh, you might say, well, uh, my church isn't an encouragement. Well, you start then. You start being the encourager. God has a rule. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I'll guarantee you, if you'll start encouraging people, someone will encourage you. It's just the way it works. Don't wait for someone else. You know, if David had waited for somebody else to encourage him, man, we, we wouldn't be reading about David today. <laughs> he encouraged himself in the Lord and led his men to have courage. The only ones who went into the land of those 12 were Joshua and Caleb. They had courage. They trusted the Lord. And God blessed them because of it. You know, God wants us to be a, a, a blessing to others. In, uh, in Galatians, he says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know what the law of Christ is? Love one another. That's what church is all about. That's not the only place you love people, but it's part of it. Uh, in Philippians he, uh, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, he says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. And we're to be a, a, a help to each other. And then he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. I think that's part of it. In uh, Colossians chapter 2, uh, he says, That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. And it unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. And we need to be knit together in love. And don't wait for somebody else to be the lover. You, know? <coughs> you be the person who, who follows the Lord. We don't face life alone. If you're saved, you have the Lord, number one. But if you're saved, you're a part of a community of, of people, Christians. Now, you should have a local church that you identify with. But even when you travel, we've had times when we've gone to other countries and other places Listen, when there's other Christians there, you have an immediate common bond. You don't even have to speak the same language. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, because the, the joy of the Lord that's, that's common to both of us. Uh, don't forsake what God has given you. In Hebrews, he, he talks about don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Listen, you get offended, work it out. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for your church. Uh, Christians don't face life alone. Someone wrote a song called Footprints, where it, it gave the picture of a person's life as footprints in the sand. And when they got saved, all of a sudden there was two footprints. They were walking with the Lord. And as the poem goes, as they looked at their life, they saw that when they had been in trouble, there was only one set of footprints. And they said, Lord, why, why did you forsake me when, when I had all that trouble? He said, child, I didn't forsake you. I carried you. See, we're not alone in this thing of, of life. If you trust Christ, uh, you have a Savior who said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. What a blessing. And we can count on him in good times and bad times. He should be able to count on us in good times and bad times. Uh, don't, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. 
Let me give you one last thing. I just throw this in for free. The Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. If you don't know what that means, find it out. Find out. Prove it. Make it, make it real in, in your own life. And I would say this. You know, the key question is, do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Uh, have you received that first truth? Salvation. Jesus said, you must be born again. Uh, there needs to, to be a, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he's the only way to God is through Christ. It's through salvation. We can't work our way to heaven. We can't deserve heaven. We have to receive it as a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me encourage you this morning. Start off by knowing that you're saved. The Bible says these are written that you may know. It's not by a feeling. It's not even by so much what you do. It's by believing what God has done. You can know the Lord. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have to be people who are discouraged. We need to learn to encourage ourselves in the Lord and to be an encourager to others. You know, there's some folks that are really draining. Don't be one of those. Be a person that energizes others, that, uh, that helps folks, and that, that, that has something good to say about the Lord and about what God is doing in your life. This morning, maybe you need to trust Christ as your Savior. I, I don't know uh, what your relationship with God might be. Uh, he's done everything necessary for you to be a child of God. He came to earth, lived, died, rose again. Uh, he's done everything. And he offers to us a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I'd encourage you. You need that gift. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't make one yourself. <laughs> You've got to get it from the Lord. And I encourage you this morning to trust Christ as your Savior. Uh, be encouraged. Be an encourager. And it starts with knowing the Lord. Let's go to him in, in prayer this morning. With heads bowed and, and in an attitude of prayer, maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe there's some part of this message this morning that, that you need to make real in, in your own life. Father, thank you so much for your, your word. Thank you for those who've gone before. And uh, Lord, for uh, the message that, that you have in your word here. Uh, Father, help us not to stop short of what you intend for us. Uh, Lord, help us to... Uh, to cross the Jordan in the sense of living by faith. Well, I pray if there are those this morning here that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would not only convict them, but draw them to yourself, that they might trust you. Lord, as Christians, help us to be committed to, uh, to things of faith and to, to living for you. Help us to get past the, uh, the dangers and the difficulties by your strength and to, to live our lives for you. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.